Mahandas or Mahatma, as he's known, a great soul, Gandhi, is probably one of the most famous people we have discussed this semester. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Gandhi before. Uh, he's very famous for his uh, movement for the independence in India and his ideas of nonviolence, which of course we're studying here. We're looking at this essay that he wrote in many different forms, but uh, it's known as Ahimsa, which uh, means nonviolence. Um, so Ahimsa or the way of nonviolence. So a little bit about Gandhi's life. He of course was born in India and eventually uh, at one point in time went to London to study law. And then he went back to India and then took an opportunity actually to uh, be a lawyer in South Africa, which was uh, occupied by Great Britain. It is his time in South Africa that really transformed his uh, life and which formed his uh, political and ethical uh, philosophies, which of course we're setting now. In South Africa, Gandhi is said to have gone there thinking himself as a Briton first and an Indian second. But it was his experience of overt racism where uh, Indians, for example, could not walk on footpaths, uh, but instead, you know, if, if they were seen doing that, a police officer would just push them off into the street. They could not ride, you know, on buses, they had to, on the seats, they had to sit on the floor, it couldn't be near the front, uh, and all sorts of other things where Indians were, of course, treated as second-class citizens, and then, you know, Africans, third-class citizens, basically. And so it's that time in... South Africa, where Gandhi, upon facing this overt racism, was faced with the question of, well, you know, do I go back to India or do I stay in South Africa and resist? And Gandhi chose to resist. And he lived there, I believe, for about 21 years, actually, in South Africa. And this is where he develops the formative, uh, you know, parts of his philosophy. And he's very much influenced by, for example, Henry David Thoreau, the famous American uh, writer and philosopher, famous for the novel Walden, who is friends with uh, Ralph Wal uh, Waldo Emerson. And uh, Walden's, I really recommend reading that book. It's super interesting. It's, it's where he tries to live on his own in the wild for two years. He's not really in the wild. It's like almost kind of like a backyard of like this giant property that... Uh, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson owned and he like relies on his I believe aunt for like laundry and stuff so it's he's not quite really self-sufficient but it's a really really fascinating book but it, I think he's most famous for though uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson is his uh, essay called Civil Disobedience and it's that essay where he refuses to pay taxes because he doesn't want to support the Mexican-American War, he thinks it's unjustified. It's that famous essay, Civil Disobedience, that influences Gandhi in the ways of nonviolent resistance. Gandhi, of course, then, after South Africa, goes back to India, and he successfully, actually, ends up pushing the British Empire to leave India. And he famously... You know, they confront him and they're like, what do you expect us to just, you know, get up and walk out of India? And Gandhi says, yes, that's exactly what I expect you to do. And one of the fo most famous uh, moments is where he led actually a salt march down to the ocean where uh, Indians were not allowed to use salt. And of course, you know, to buy salt and salt was, of course, a, a very important commodity in the preservation of foods. And so Gandhi led this huge march of Indians down to the ocean, to the beach, to collect salt, to, you know, nonviolently protest that law that the British had imposed on them. And eventually, of course, all that what that does is undermine British rule, and eventually it becomes too much, uh, too much of a liability, too much money they're spending to maintain this rule in India, that uh, the British eventually do leave India. However, in 1948, Gandhi is actually assassinated by a Hindu nationalist, and uh, th that marked the end of his life, but certainly not the end of his influence, because roughly, you know, 20 years later, 
uh, well, maybe a little less, 15 years later or so, Martin Luther King Jr. actually is influenced by Henry David Thoreau and then Gandhi now. And uh, so Martin Luther King Jr.'s civil rights movement, nonviolent protests in the United States, protesting Jim Crow and racism, was influenced by Gandhi's ideas of nonviolence. So there's a really interesting kind of thread from Thoreau to Gandhi to Martin Luther King Jr., and I, I don't know so much in the case of Thoreau, but certainly at least in Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., their ideas of nonviolence uh, and civil disobedience were successful in those uh, in, in that respect, the, the, the fights which they fought. So let's get into uh, Gandhi's philosophy here of nonviolence. So for Gandhi, nonviolence is something which is kind of transcendental, this, this idea of nonviolence. It transcends person, it transcends your material being. And he says that violence is needed for the protection of things external to ourselves, external to the mind, to the spirit. Because violence is needed for, uh, you know, we can think of like the state of nature and protecting your property. Violence is needed, you know, in hunting animals to get food so you can nourish your body and survive. But he says nonviolence, on the other hand, is needed for the protection of the self. And he means specifically one's honor. That nonviolence is needed for your honor as an individual, a human being with reason and uh, with a good moral nature. And he references actually uh, prophets throughout all of human history, uh, different people, whether it be the Buddha or Jesus, and so on, and the ways in which they taught nonviolence, different lessons of truth, justice, and brotherhood, this uniting together as one people, and you know, like turn the cheek, and all these different sayings which promote nonviolent resistance or just generally nonviolent existence. So Gandhi says, man as animal is violent, but as spirit is nonviolent. So there is this conflict, he admits, where on the one hand, being a human being existing in society is founded on violence, but of course, to become a truly good, moral, and spiritual person, you need to transcend that, uh, ma those material needs for the sake of your spiritual self. And so he says, suffering is the law of human beings then, War is the law of the jungle, but suffering is infinitely more powerful than the law of the jungle for converting the opponent and opening his ears, which are otherwise shut to the voice of reason. So Gandhi's, uh, one of his main claims is that you actually, to uh, implement whatever your views are, to overcome suffering, you are actually going to be more powerful by embracing nonviolence, because you are going to be able to use reason to communicate with your opponents, and it's not always guaranteed, but as God is going to try to make the argument, that uh, re resistance which is overcome through nonviolence is going to be long lasting, whereas that overcome by violence is only temporary. So he says, Taking life may be a duty. We do destroy as much life as we think necessary for sustaining our body. Thus, for food, we take life, vegetable, and other. And for health, we destroy mosquitoes and the like by the use of disinfectants, etc. And we do not think that we are guilty of irreligion in doing so. For the benefit of the species, we kill carnivorous beasts. Even manslaughter may be necessary in certain cases. Suppose a man runs amok and goes furiously about, sword in hand, and killing anyone that comes in his way, and no one dares to capture him alive. Anyone who dispatches this lunatic will learn the gratitude of the sorry, earn the gratitude of the community and be regarded as a benevolent man. But there's a difference, we'll see, in that defense of the community from this, you know, madman who's running around with the sword in hand trying to kill people. There's a difference from that, uh, 
you know, taking the life of, uh, you know, things like vegetables and, and, and plants and so on for uh, nutrients. And then also there's a difference from those two things and uh, murder outright. So the difference in this case of where the you know, person, the murderer is coming in and, and you're going to protect yourself from the murderer or protect the community from the murderer. The difference is that, as Gandhi says, the essence of violence is that there is intention to harm another. That you, when you commit violence, you intend to cause suffering to another. Whether this be a group of people, a person, an animal, or uh, otherwise. He says, however, though, my nonviolence does not admit of running away from danger and leaving dear ones unprotected. Between violence and cowardly flight, I can only prefer violence to cowardice. While violence may be necessary to protect oneself, that doesn't necessarily mean it is violent, or it is an act of uh, himsa, violence. And the difference is, in protecting yourself from uh, a murderer who's coming in, and you, you want to stop that, what Gandhi is saying is that you do not intend to harm that person who wishes to harm you. You intend to protect yourself from that person, to stop that person. And that may end up being, in extreme circumstances, that may mean that you have to maybe actually cause suffering to that person and maybe kill them. But Gandhi says, so the ethical approach here in practicing his nonviolence in this case would be to do whatever you can that maybe you uh, run away from the person, you uh, do something where maybe you push them out of a door and you can slam the door shut and lock it or something like that. Maybe you have to, uh, I don't know, like, you know, let's say they have a gun and you have to like break their hand or something so they can't use the gun that you don't intend to actually hurt them for the sake of hurting them, but you are doing it to protect yourself to stop that violence from occurring. And that's the difference from violence outright and a kind of nonviolent resistance. Now this uh, nonviolent resistance, Gandhi says, is love. That practicing nonviolence is practicing love because it is having empathy for your fellow human beings of course, it's having empathy for those that you want to protect from suffering, and it's having empathy for those who are committing or, or attempting to commit acts of violence, because you too want to also stop them from going through something that would be potentially irrevocable in the, in the taking the life of someone else, potentially. And so, even your enemies, he says, love applies to, that you love your enemies in this way that you wish for whatever it is that's causing them to commit violence also to uh, come to an end. Now, this is, of course, very, very difficult, but it's also something extremely noble because the practice of nonviolence is going to take an extreme amount of willpower. It's not something that anyone can easily do because in many ways we have certain natural instincts, uh, a kind of uh, fight or flight instinct, and maybe in some the flight is more present. But we also favor, and, and Gandhi thinks too, in society, a more violent approach to certain things. And so the reason why then nonviolence takes an extreme amount of willpower is because nonviolence presupposes the ability to strike. That nonviolence, the one who can truly practice nonviolence, who truly then practices this art of love, or really the science, as Gandhi uh, refers to it, is one who has the potential to hurt someone else, and they choose not to. Because think about that. A baby cannot practice nonviolence, because they don't have the ability, at least at a certain age, to actively hurt others. An adult, though, who especially maybe has weapons around, it takes much more uh, willpower to prevent whatever the different variations of these acts of violence may be. This willpower goes beyond, though, simply just this 
uh, presupposing the ability to strike, which is really profound when you think about that, that one has the power to take the life of someone else in maybe potentially uh, dire circumstances like defending yourself or others from a murderer and yet chooses not to. But that choosing not to and that and nonviolence is not something which is based on cowardice, we'll see. It is instead, as Gandhi says, something which requires not being afraid of dying. So he says, I would rather have India resort to arms in order to defend her honor than that she should in a cowardly manner become or remain a helpless witness to her own dishonor. But I believe that nonviolence is infinitely superior to violence. Forgiveness is more manly than punishment. And so one who fears death is one for Gandhi who either is the extreme coward and is overcome with this fear of death and so can't uh, passively resist, or it is one who fears death so much that they then willingly cause suffering to another to preserve their own life. Only one who practices nonviolence is not a coward, but instead actually contains courage because they are not afraid to lose everything in practicing this transcendental spiritual uh, right. So again, uh, as I said, the practice of nonviolence calls forth the greatest courage. And Gandhi says about this, Nonviolence is not a resignation from all real fighting against wickedness. That nonviolence is not saying, oh, you know, uh, you might be too afraid because what if someone, some big powerful person wants to come and take your things? Would you really want to risk your life for the sake of those things? And so you just let someone bully you and take everything. Gandhi is saying, no, that is not nonviolence. It is not being weak. Nonviolence is actually... Uh, putting the most amount of willpower that one can against violence and the risk of death itself. That it is fight. On the contrary, he says, the nonviolence of my conception is a more active and real fight against wickedness than retaliation whose very nature is to increase wickedness. I contemplate a mental and therefore moral opposition to immorality. I seek entirely to blunt the edge of the tyrant's sword, not by putting up against it a sharper-edged weapon, but by disappointing his expectation that I would be offering physical resistance. The resistance of the soul that I, that I should offer would elude him. It would at first dazzle him and at last compel recognition from him, which, would recogni which recognition would not humiliate but uplift him. It may be urged that this is an ideal state, and so it is. And so Gandhi is under no illusions that this is difficult, of course. But what he thinks is that when you are confronted in a situation where violence is being imposed on you, you are being coerced. To resist it, but to resist it by not seeking to harm intentionally the individual imposing this violence on you, Gandhi thinks will awaken this uh, you know, empathy within this person, this almost a, a sense of being completely uh, unprepared for the situation that because they are so predisposed to violence that they, when confronted with nonviolence, won't know how to react. And Gandhi thinks, of course, that's not guaranteed, but he thinks that it is more likely that this person would then uh, truly realize the suffering they are committing on other individuals. But even if that doesn't occur, remember, Gandhi is not making a consequentialist argument here. Gandhi is not saying, well, I'm promoting nonviolence because I think that, you know, nine times out of ten, nonviolence works better as opposed to violence. He is making an intentionalist argument that what matters is the intention of one's action. And this is different from Kant because, of course, remember, Kant it's not solely about the intention because you can have good intentions and so lie to someone not to hurt their feelings. And of course, for Kant, that would be unethical. So there is a difference with Kant in this. I want to make sure that's clear. So, and, and I should say again, back to that, uh, 
statement that he says when confronted with either violence or cowardice, he prefers violence to cowardice. He says that because violence still takes some amount of willpower, right? As where cowardice, there is no willpower involved. One has uh, spiritually and mentally entirely just given up and forfeited everything. So that, I think that's something really interesting uh, to think about. And along those lines, then, one has to keep in mind, again, nonviolence is not complacency with injustice. It is not just saying, well, it is what it is. This is the world, right? Powerful people rule over us. It is not passivity. It is resistance. He says, no man could be actively nonviolent and not rise against social injustice no matter where it occurred. That if one claims to be practicing nonviolence and yet they allow injustice to occur, they are not practicing nonviolence. So I want to read a little bit from uh, what he says here on page 102. So this is um, someone that he had explained his theory of nonviolence to. And apparently these people tried to practice it. And Gandhi is appalled in the way they interpreted his argument about nonviolence. So he says, The people of a village near Bedia told me that they had run away whilst the police were looting their houses and molesting their women folk. When they said that they had run away because I had told them to be nonviolent, I hung my head in shame. I assured them that such was not the meaning of my nonviolence. I expected them to in intercept the mightiest power that might be in the act of harming those who were under their protection and draw without retaliation all harm upon their own heads, even to the point of death, but never to run away from the storm center. It was manly enough to defend one's property, honor, or religion at the point of the sword. It was manlier and nobler to defend them without seeking to injure the wrongdoer. But it was unmanly, unnatural, and dishonorable to forsake the post of duty and, in order to save one's own skin, to leave property, honor, or religion to the mercy of the wrongdoer. I could see my way of delivering a, uh, delivering a hinsa, nonviolence, to those who know how to die not to those who were afraid of death. And so, about this science of nonviolence, it is not simply something that is meant to take place against resistance, so that if there's no resistance, you're not nonviolent. But instead, nonviolence for Gandhi is a norm. It is something that is meant to be uh, a, a, just the state of existence for a human being that practices it at all times. So he says, no institution can be made nonviolent by compulsion. Nonviolence and truth cannot be written into a constitution. They have to be adopted of one's own free will. They must sit naturally upon us like next to skin, uh, skin garments or else they become a contradiction in terms. And here he is equating them, his philosophy of nonviolence to that of uh, the social contract, and this idea that uh, an institution of which we are all bound to, like a government, is only justified if it has been voluntarily consented to. That any amount of coercion nullifies the legitimacy of that institution. So not only then is nonviolence an ethical philosophy for Gandhi, it is a political philosophy in that it is meant to be written into uh, by uh, willingly uh, governments that govern, of course, uh, people to bring about a more ethical uh, world. So we've spoken this whole time, of course, about nonviolence and, and the ways in which nonviolence is ethically, politically, and spiritually right for Gandhi. But what about violence itself? Why not, in certain cases, embrace violence like, I don't know, when facing the Nazis, right? Why not embrace violence then? Well, Gandhi says to that, that the reason violence is objected to is because when it appears to do good, the good is only temporary. 
On the contrary, the evil that it does is permanent. So, violence against violence, he says, endorses further violent reta retaliation. And there are many reasons for this. On the one hand, of course, uh, there is just the, the psychological feeling that one gets when they have been aggressed upon that eventually they want to retaliate. There are uh, things that are built into institutions that last. There are things like, think about uh, what led to World War II and the way in which World War I was ended, which kind of, you know, it seemed like we had peace. And then slowly, because of the, the way in which uh, it was ended in a kind of coercive manner, Resentment builds up, which then breeds even worse violence. And that, and this actually goes back to Kant and what he writes about in his text, uh, Perpetual Peace, that the only way you can ever have truly lasting peace is if that peace has uh, come about based on terms that have been mutually agreed to with no coercion. Because if there is any bit of coercion, any violence that produced that peace, it's always going to be a seed which has uh, negative consequences down the line because institutions as well are not void of the effects of violence uh, just in the way that human beings as well psychologically, uh, you know, this has repercussions down the line. And so violence then, even in self-defense, he says, begins the roots of violence and character. So not just then does violence uh, against violence endorse further violent retaliation, but even when you use violence, and, and, and here again, right, violence to intentionally hurt that person because you um, are, are, are angry at that person for hurting you or someone else you love, that because remember, it's the intention of hurting that person and not just stopping the, 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 the suffering, that that begins the roots of violence in your character. So he says, History teaches one that those who have, no doubt, with honest motives, ousted the greedy by using brute force against them, have in their turn become a prey to the disease of the conquered. So violence is something which uh, can never be justified, right? That uh, two wrongs do not make a right. And that violence, uh, like I talked about when we discussed Buddhism, Gandhi is saying here basically, uh, and, uh, sorry, what I talked about with Buddhism in regard to uh, karma and how, you know, it's like with the rock, uh, the piece of water going down the rock, that it goes down once, it doesn't really, you know, it's not going to necessarily go down that path again, but another drop of water and another one starts to carve out a path where now then the water naturally flows down that path. And that's the same thing Gandhi is saying here with regard to violence, that you do it once, and it makes it more likely that you do it a second time, and that makes it more likely, again, that you do it a third and fourth, and so on. And I think it should be said that for Gandhi, um, nonviolence was, of course, extremely successful. It allowed India to gain its independence. However, though, uh, here's a discussion question. Is nonviolence an achievable reality? Now, we know in certain contexts it was achievable that uh, the civil rights movement and the independence of India, but is it something that should, you know, is it a normative uh, claim for, of nonviolence? Should nonviolence always be practiced? Is it an actually achievable where nonviolence could totally eventually root out all violence? Does it matter whether nonviolence is practical or not? I mean, maybe it, it doesn't. Maybe you think, well, it, you know, it truly is just the right thing to do regardless of whether or not it works, right? So maybe you would agree based on the intentionalist uh, point of view. If nonviolence is impractical, is it therefore untrue? So even if nonviolence uh, doesn't actually achieve necessarily, um, you know, a preservation, of, a greater preservation of peace as opposed to fighting violence with violence, does that necessarily mean that Gandhi's, you know, the premises of uh, leading to Gandhi's conclusion of nonviolence, does it necessarily mean that it's untrue, that it's false, that all the things that he said about nonviolence? What do you think? 